Good evening and welcome. Let me start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung, and Boonwurrung people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional owners of the unceded land on which tonight's lecture is taking place. And I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I also acknowledge the importance of indigenous knowledge in the academy. As a community of researchers, teachers, professional staff, and students, we are privileged to work and learn every day with indigenous colleagues and partners. I extend my respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us here tonight. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to the 2023 Griffin Economic History Public Lecture. The lecture series was established in 2019 and made possible by the generous support of the Peter Griffin and Terry Swan Foundation. Both Peter and Terry are here with us this evening. Welcome to you both. And while I have the opportunity, happy birthday, Peter. Peter is a Bachelor of Commerce alumnus, and he has had a long and successful career in the business world, particularly in investment banking. In 2008, he was honored as a member of the Order of Australia for his service to the Australian community through support for medical research, the arts, and charitable organizations. Peter is passionate about economic history and is keen that students who leave the University of Melbourne, not just with a good understanding of business, economics, accounting, and finance, but also a profound awareness of recurrent mistakes made by governments, industry, and the banking sector. The Griffin Economic History Lecture features cutting edge economic history research that informs business and economics education here at the University of Melbourne. Tonight's lecture is delivered by the Griffin Chair in Economic History, made possible by the generous funding from the Peter Griffin and Terry Swan Foundation. Peter and Terry, we are ever so grateful for your crucial ongoing support in bringing economic history back to Melbourne. Let me now invite my colleague, Professor David Harris, head of the Department of Economics, to formally introduce our distinguished speaker tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kaufman. <clears throat> uh, it is my pleasure to introduce my esteemed colleague and speaker for this evening, Professor James Kaising Kong. Uh, we are honoured to have Professor Kong join us as the inaugural Griffin Chair in Economic History at the Faculty of Economics and Business. Previously, he served as the Sin and Isaac Suede Professor of Economic History at the University of Hong Kong and the Yan Ai Foundation Professor of Social Science at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. He completed his PhD in Economics at the University of Cambridge. Professor Kong's research interests are strongly based in economic history, institutions, culture and the development of China. He has published more than 50 journal articles and book chapters in, for example, the Cambridge Economic History of China, the Economic Journal, the Journal of the European Economic Association, the Quarterly Journal of Economics, the Review of Economics and Statistics, and journals devoted to the specialised fields of economic history, development and comparative economics. In 2021, Professor Kong was elected president of the Association of Comparative Economics. Currently, he serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Economic History and Regional Science and Urban Economics. During his academic career in Hong Kong, he supervised 15 PhD students and placed them in universities in Hong Kong, the Chinese mainland and North America. We look forward to working closely with Professor Kong and we are honoured that he is sharing his expertise in economic and political history of China with us tonight. Tonight's presentation is being recorded and the recording will be available on our faculty website. 
Following the presentation, there will be the, an opportunity for audience questions, which my colleague, Associate Professor Laura Panzer, will moderate. Following the Q&A, our supporter, Peter Griffin, will share a few words with us. So, Professor Kong, I'm now delighted to officially hand over to you. Thank you, David. I would like to express my deepest gratitude to um, the Peter Griffin and Terry Swan Foundation for the generous support of economic history and to colleagues at the University of Melbourne for giving me the honor to be the inaugural chair. So this evening's topic is about the historic rise of the Chinese Communist Party. So the adjective historic is being um, uh, hidden in the title just to make it more general. So the historic rise of the Chinese Communist Party here after C, uh, CCP is one of the most momentous events of the 20th century, uh, which shaped the fortunes of an enormous number of people, both inside China and elsewhere. So the CCP arose within the broad context of uh, rising populist um, revolutions incited by extreme ideologies in the aftermath of wars and which in turn given rise to more wars. According to Eric Hobsbawm, the historian in his book, The Age of Extreme. Now, notable examples include fascism, nazism, uh, nazism and uh, with the rise of the Soviet Union, of course, also communism. But Nazi Germany, fascist Italy, and with the breakup of the Soviet Union, they've all been consigned to history, except, except the CCP continues to live on and uh, becomes the world's largest communist party and increasingly challenges the established hegemon uh, hegemonic order according to a certain perspective. Now, the slide you're seeing is a snapshot um, showing you that the CCP is now a huge and complex bureaucracy run by a small number of political elites relative to its population. But a century ago, slightly more than that, 1921, it was no more than a very humble reading group founded by these two gentlemen whose aim was to spread Marxism among students and industrial workers. And even back in the late 1930s, it was at best, the CCP could at best be considered a struggling party whose state capacity was, according to a couple of political scientists, Lewitsky and Wei, comparable to today's Afghanistan. So all of this suggests that the rise of the CCP was not inevitable, okay? Because it nearly got wiped out by the dominant political party, namely Kuomintang or KMT at the time. So first of all, um, the communists were actually um, forced out of the cities by Chiang Kai-shek, the leader at the time, uh, after his victorious return from the so-called Northern Expedition, during which he successfully wiped out the warlords, okay? So the CCP were forced to the rural areas, but to their credit, they expediently established a number of revolutionary bases in the several provinces in South China, okay? But of course, Chiang Kai-shek wouldn't let them, wouldn't just sit there and let them expand. So in a series of what historians call encirclement campaigns, Chiang actually tried to annihilate the revolutionary base and uh, you know, the uh, CCP was dealt with a severe bloat and uh, they were forced to embark on the very deadly Long March. So this is a Wikipedia map that shows you two things. First of all, it shows you in pink, these are the revolutionary bases established by the CCP after they're being sort of chased by the, uh, the KMT to go to the rural areas. And the crosses indicate that these are bases that were crushed by the KMT, okay? And then the other thing that I would like to show you with this graph are the routes that were taken by the CCP 
in the escape from their previous revolutionary basis. And you can see they were chased by the KMT to the extent that they had to detour all the way to the west and then through it all the way up to the, um, the northwestern province of Sanxi, which was a very barren land, but it was close to the Soviet border. So hopefully that could sort of afford them some protection from the KMT. Now, the long march, I said it was deadly for two reasons. In the first three months of the retreat, they were subjected to constant bombardment by Chiang Kai-shek's air force with repeated attacks from his ground troops. So he, Chiang, was, Chiang managed to devastate like half of the CCP army, so le leaving them in extremely low morale by the time they reach um, a place in the southwestern part of China from which they muster their courage and try to escape the KMT and you know, moves all the way up west. So this barren land uh, called Yan'an, which became the communist revolutionary base for the next 12 years between 1935 and 1947. So they established, they mustered their, their effort there and they tried to you know, grow their membership and try to return. But, so this place, a historian recently wrote a book, a very eminent Joseph Azurik, uh, called the Accidental Holy Land. So it was not planned, but they were forced to go there and it became the revolutionary base for the CCP during a very important period of time. Now, however, uh, by the time for the surviving ones, they, the membership was hugely decimated. 90% of the members got killed. Many of them were killed by the KMT, but for the surviving ones, the long march was a very difficult journey because, you know, many of them died of physical exertion, others died of starvation. So by the time they made there, you know, they make it there, it was like only 10% of the people remain. So 90% of the membership were decimated. So that raises the question. So how on earth could the CCP actually grow from this very small base of membership. Fast forward in just four years time, so beginning from 1937, membership actually increased by a massive 20 times, okay, in a mere four years time. So what happened in 1937? So 1937 marked the time of a full-fledged invasion by the Japanese army, okay? on the pretext of searching for a lost soldier, they invaded China. Historians have argued that this is not an accident because the Japanese already occupied northeastern China, the three provinces there, collectively known as Manchuria, for six years. So this was a plot that eventually transpired into greater aggression. Now, the paramount leader, Chairman Mao, Chairman Mao Zedong, had a theory, and this is actually not really something that only Mao came up with. So my father actually also talks about it when I was a kid, I remember now. And I decided to sort of test it with data when I, you know, when I, um, at a stage that I could really muster together all the different data sources to give a test. Now, this is a very interesting speech given by Chairman Mao. And it was available only in Chinese, so I took the liberty of translating it into English, and let me just read it out to you. Precisely, here I quote, precisely because of the Japanese Imperial Army, which had occupied a large part of China, making Chinese people know where to go. Once they understood, they began taking up armed struggle, resulting in the establishment of many counter-Japanese military bases, thereby creating favorable conditions for the coming war of liberation. Japanese capitalists and warlords have done a good deed for us, the communists. If ever we need to say thank you, I would like to say thank you to the Japanese warlords. This is tongue in cheek, this is half serious, but only somebody like Mao Zedong was able to say this, okay? Other people who say it could get themselves into deep trouble, okay? 
So following on that intuition or observation, um, we try to ask two questions. So the first question is, did the Japanese intrusion cause the CCP to thrive during Sino-Japanese War? Okay, so I'm trained as an economist, although I you know, have a deep passion for history. We need, you know, we're judged by our profession. We need to be able to show that it is X causing Y and not just X being correlated with Y. Okay, so this is what we are trying to do in this project. And to the extent that we can prove that, we ask the following question. So what are the mechanisms, what are the channels to account for the phenomenal rise of the CCP? Now, time permitting, I would also want to take you through some interesting results showing you how this, um, how this whole idea of a rise of nationalism gets to persist to this day, okay? Now, let me now expand a little bit on how external aggression leads to war suffering and how war suffering leads to the rise of nationalism, this chain causal effect. So Japanese invasion came as a shock to the entire nation. So the killing of civilians was indiscriminate. It was large scale and the damage of property was unprecedented. So altogether, this heightened the peasants' concern for survival. So here are some statistics as documented by the authorities from various sites. So you could look at the rampant killing of civilians amounted to 7.5 million, which made up 1.4% of the Chinese population in 1934. And there were massacres, and massacres were, dis were, were defined as you know, every time you have 800 people being executed collectively, that qualifies for a massacre. And many houses, or as many as 8.8 .8 million houses, got burned down. So these are images that speak volume, that speak very powerful to the statistics that I just briefly show you. Now, war suffering not only refers to, you know, killing people, but also to very profound humiliation. And this could sort of add, add, sort of add to you know, the amount of war suffering. But before I show you that, um, a political scientist back in 1962 was making the point that Mao was trying to awaken a peasantry by connecting their survival to the collective national identity or national defense, in short. Now, in his narrative, which I find very credible and powerful, uh, Professor Thomas Johnson argued that prior to the war, the peasant was absorbed in local matters and had only the dim sense of China as a nation, okay? They know what China was, but they don't care about this collective national identity. Now, with the external aggression, the Chinese peasant realized that his own peril was also China's peril, okay? So those who survived concluded that simply the only hope lay in resistance and the communists were there to help them. So nationalism, as I mentioned briefly earlier, was further strengthened by humiliation and hatred associated with this humiliation. So there were tons of rape cases being reported and uh, women were also subjugated to other forms of sexual subservience, such as in a specific context of China, uh, comfort women's centers, okay? So he, one of the picture uh, shows you that uh, even in Shanghai that was uh, occurring. So summing up this hypothesis or narrative, so Chalmers Johnson calls this peasant nationalism because it was not nationalism as understood by you know, an assimilated uh, uh, group of intelligentsia in the treaty ports, but it was like percolated down to the very grassroots levels. Okay, so basically the argument is that war suffering allowed the communists to present themselves as nationalists and as the national leaders of patriotic resistance to the Japanese. So I think these two elements very well summed up what was going on on the ground at the time. 
Okay, so it doesn't really matter that a peasantry, a half literate or illiterate peasantry, uh, couldn't comprehend the nuances of communism because at the time what is important is survival. So communism and nationalism are basically one and the same thing as far as Lucin Bianco and uh, Chalmers Johnson were concerned. So because it had its roots deeply steeped in the peasants' concern for survival and for the hatred of the enemy for the sufferings they had brought to bear upon them. So let me just give you a very brief hypothesis. So this is how economists and social scientists go away testing you know, the ideas, despite the fact that this is occurring, or especially because this is occurring in a historical context. So we can sort of reconstruct certain data and try to test whether you know, some ideas propounded by historians and political scientists and other social scientists was true. So we could sort of assume that, based on what I've just shown you, war suffering was greater in areas where the Japanese army was. Okay? We call that the Japanese occupied area. So in that case, the influence of the CCP would grow faster than in the so-called non-occupied areas dominated by the KMT or Kuomintang. Okay? So how do we sort of visualize this sort of hypothesis or idea. So let me help you uh, visualize this hypothesis by sort of showing you this is a map taken from the Japanese intelligence archive that was released by the Japanese government only a few years ago. Now, the good thing, the nice thing, the inspiring thing about this map is that the blue line, I didn't draw the blue line, it was drawn by the Japanese intelligence or authorities. I just make the color a little bit easier for you to, to see. So it neatly or nicely separates the KMT, which you can see are the red, you know, sort of crosses, um, you know, you can see from the legend where the KMT was. So it sort of separates the KMT from the Japanese army. So in other words, think of the blue line as a boundary that that, that is the front line. That is the front line and is represent battles and wars between the Japanese and the KMT. The KMT took on the blunt because they were the dominant political party. They had to fight the Japanese. Where is the CCP? The CCP was tugging along the rear line or the back line of where the Japanese army was. Okay, it was not the dominant party. The Japanese didn't really think they were a big deal, so they were, this gave them an advantage. This provided them with the advantage. They could just huck along there and launch some guerrilla warfare you know, from time to time, but the Japanese just didn't think it was important enough to catch their attention. Now, this map, so to speak, so allows us to actually demarcate where the various military parties were located at the time. Okay, so this gives us an idea whether, so going by our hypothesis, we should expect communist influence to grow faster in areas occupied by the Japanese rather than in areas dominated by the KMT. Okay, so this gives you an idea of how, we, how our thought experiment works. Now, so we have our so-called explanatory variable set up or, you know, this is a key thing explaining variations across China with respect to the rise of the CCP. So how are we going to measure the rise of the CCP? Ideally, it would be best if we have the numbers of CCP membership. Uh, we could have granular data, fine data available at the county by county level, then we can see, oh, county A grows faster. So, you know, county A is JOA, is Japanese occupied. So we should, you know, be able to test our hypothesis. Unfortunately, that is wartime. And so such fine data at the ground level is not available. What do we do? We stop the, we stop the research or we look for other ways. So, of course, we look for other ways. 
So fortunately, we are able to come up with three different ways of measuring local CCP influence. The first is we are fortunate to be able to document the biographic data of middle to upper rank cadres at the level of a regiment commander or colonel or above during the wartime period. So we're able to document who joins the party between 1935 to 1947, uh, where did they join, what is the rank when they join. So we have detailed information on that. That should be able to provide us with some idea of how to measure the CCP influence. So, okay. so now, as you can see from this, so the left-hand side shows you the distribution, which we geocoded. So it shows you the distribution of CCP members, or membership uh, during the 1921 to 1936 period. So that was before the Japanese invasion. And the one on the right-hand side, and I highlighted the, uh, um, it with the rectangle, shows you that this was the part where CCP membership grew fastest. And the two arrow indicates that this was the direction from which the Japanese army invaded. They were in the northeastern provinces at the time, so they actually came down from there. Now, using this variable is good, but it is also underestimating because it doesn't say anything about the four lower ranks, okay? Because below the colonel, you have three lower ranks, plus if you include the foot soldiers, that would be four lower ranks, okay? So what we try to do is to make up for this shortfall by employing another measure, another indicator called model soldiers. So by definition, these are soldiers who earned the reputation by fighting in the anti-Japanese war and were killed. So we have information of when they joined the party and the hometown. So this is not just a mechanical um, um, relationship because we actually are able to know where they joined the party instead of where they were killed. So we're not documenting where they were killed, but we were documenting where they were joined because after joining in County A, Province B, they could be sent to, you know, sort of County B, Province C to fight the war. Okay, so there's no uh, mechanical relationship there. And you can see the pattern is consistent with the first variable. In other words, it is in the northern part of China where the martyr soldiers, you know, joined um, the most. Finally, and not the least, we are also able to document the rise of the CCP using information on the size of the guerrilla base. As I mentioned earlier, the CCP was not the dominant party. It didn't actually fight in the majority of uh, major battles, okay? So you have to give the KMT the credit. They were the party who took on, you know, who bore the brunt of the Japanese invasion. But we were able to measure the number of soldiers residing in a county's guerrilla base in 1940, okay? How do we know that? So you may not be able to see from afar, but I sort of highlighted two guerrilla bases of the CCP. So one sets 1,500. So with the larger circle, it sets 1,500, which means there were 1,500 guerrilla soldiers there. And in the smaller circle, it sets 200, which means it has 200 members there, okay? So we were able to utilize that information to measure the local influence of the CCP in terms of its expansion of the guerrilla base. So now we have sort of like three different markers of local CCP growth across counties. Okay, so our sample includes 1,700 um, counties covering 24 provinces in 19, and we sort of like mapped this to a GIS map in 1953. So we, uh, that's how we constructed our data. Uh, in the process, we had to exclude the three northeastern provinces because most of them had been occupied by the Japanese for six years and for other four provinces like Inner, Mo Inner Mongolia, Xinjiang, Qinghai. Always no data, 
Okay, so you can do anything more than that. So I wouldn't be going into too technical um, details here. I just want to mention that the existence of a boundary, which you have just seen, suggests that we could perhaps make use of some spatial model for which to identify the effects of Japanese occupation on the three measures that we just talked about. Okay, so if you look at the equation, which for some of you might, um, um, might not be aesthetically too pleasant, uh, all you need to do is to look at, okay, so it's the occupied area in red on the right-hand side. This will be the key variable or factor to account for the various dependent variables that I just sort of walked you through, okay? So the rest you just, you know, have to trust me that it's all um, being taken care of. This is how the boundary looks like if you geocode it, okay? And the, the blue area represents the 100 kilometers away from the, um, from the boundary. So why 100 kilometers? Because the average county size in North China at the time, the radius is about 50 kilometers. So the diameter is about 100 kilometers. So you could sort of use 100 kilometers as a benchmark, but you know, computer packages make things so easy nowadays. So you could sort of use 100, 200, 300, 400, and so forth to check how robust your results are. Now, this is a fun part or not so fun part. So instead of showing you a very ugly table full of you know, numbers, I sort of transformed that all into graphs. Okay, so how do we read this? The, so there are these three variables there, the CCP cadres, the CCP model soldiers, the size of the guerrilla base, those are the things I talked about as markers of the CCP local influence. So the, the, the thick bars represent the coefficients. These are coefficients that we, you know, that we obtain as a result of running the regression that I just showed you, the thing that some of you may actually refuse to see, but this is the result. And the thin line is the confidence interval. So the confidence interval, if it, if it goes through the zero, the zero value, if it you know, goes further down, which means this is not significant. Now, eyeballing these figures, you can readily actually see that the confidence interval, the thin line, actually never touches zero. So it could be assumed safely that, oh, this is significant. In other words, the Japanese occupied area does have a significant effect on the density of the CCP cadres, on the density of the modern soldiers, and on the size of the guerrilla base. So we can sort of based on these results to suggest that oh, we are able to show that the Japanese invasion does have a causal effect on the local rise of the CCP. Now, the next question, in the, in the interest of time, I want to rush things a little bit. So the, the next important question is, and perhaps this is a more important question, so what enabled the CCP to rise? What are the underlying mechanisms? Okay, so we suggested that, 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 that there might be three mechanisms um, in accounting for the rise of the CCP. The first is something that Chalmers Johnson has called power vacuum. And what does he mean by that? So the Japanese army left the so-called power vacuum after easily terrorized the Chinese villages. What does that mean? It means that the Japanese army was finding it more difficult to govern the large territory which had proven so easy to invade, okay? Despite the fact that they had already deployed close to 1.2 million of military, it only managed to cover at most 60% of China's vast territory, okay? So what do you do? So in the words of uh, Lucin Bianco, he sums up 
this really nicely, so the Japanese army was swallowed up in the vastness of China, holding only cities and connecting railways, the countryside was all communists. Okay? So now the Japanese couldn't just leave these areas unattended and allow the CCP to move in and sort of build their power base and so forth. So what they do is to set up puppet troops. So the Japanese set up the Manchurian puppet regime, okay? And then the puppet troops were captives of KMT soldiers, remnants of uh, local warlords and local bandits, and so forth. Now we conjecture that, so we all know about the puppet troops, but nobody has actually done research in terms of showing how the communists were actually taking advantage of this, you know, sort of fake regime. So we collected the data and we sort of conjecture that the CCP would actually try to capitalize on the weaker military capacity of the puppet troops. First, they don't have the incentives to fight. Second, they were not as strong militarily as the Japanese army, okay? So it would be easy, it would be easier, it would be wiser for the CCP to focus their advancement in counties of the JOA, but then these were occupied by the puppet troops. So what we do now is to divide the JOA, the Japanese occupied area, into two parts. So one part would be the Japanese army, but the other part would be the puppet troops. We have very good numbers on where it was occupied by which. And in this graph, you can see that the blue color represents counties occupied by the real Japanese army, and then the red represents the puppet troops. Now, if you can still see it, see the confidence level. The confidence level in the blue, in the blue thing actually is getting very close to zero, if not exceeding zero. This is suggesting that there is no significant relationship between Japanese occupied areas occupied by the real Japanese army and CCP advancement. In other words, the CCP wasn't making a lot of advancement in the GOA counties occupied by the Japanese army. In contrast, in the red bar, you could see that the thin confidence level interval is actually far above the zero value. So this suggests that the CCP was actually making some headways in the GOA, you know, dominated by the puppet troops, okay? And then the green thing, you don't have to worry about that, but if you are concerned, this is, you know, sort of the first difference between the blue and the pink, um, just to show that, you know, the difference itself is also significant. Now the second, the second mechanism through which the CCP was, you know, making the advancement has been suggested by many political scientists, and that's local party building. So the CCP is well known for its ability to build organizations, especially at the grassroots level, okay? So at the grassroots level, there were three different degrees to which the CCP had actually built that. So the smallest one was the party group, which consists of fewer than 100 people, and then it becomes larger, the party chapter or party branch, and then the largest would be the Cobb County Party Committee. So when you reach the Cobb County Party Committee, you know, Ma would be sending somebody from Yan'an to help supervise and guide your establishment. So to test the idea that local party building was stronger in the Japanese occupied area, technically what we do is to interact whether a county had established a party committee. So we give the value to a county we give the value of one to a county with a party, you know, with a county party committee and the value of zero to a county without a party committee, okay? And we sort of throw in the uh, regressions again and then we look at the result. I apologize here because of the interaction term. I am unable to show you the more aesthetically pleasing graphs, but instead, you know, you have to look at the numbers, but all you have to do is to look at the row in red. 
Okay, so what this really tells you is that the, the effect of local party building was significant. So if you look at the second row, county party building, it's got a lot of stars and more stars, more the better. Okay, more stars mean it's very significantly related to each other. And if you move down one row, it tells you that county party committee has a larger effect in counties occupied by the Japanese. Sort of um, basically uh, confirming our hypothesis that uh, party build, local party building is important and it is especially important in counties occupied by the Japanese. Finally, I want to talk about this um, war suffering, which is the main theme, which is the main you know, mechanism underlying the uh, rise of the CCP. So it's an overarching concept, war suffering. So how do we test it empirically? In order to do that, we decompose war suffering into two dimensions. One is struggling for survival. How do we measure struggling for survival? We use the number of civilians killed in each county to serve as a proxy for the degree of suffering. And then we could also arguably measure humiliation and hatred by using the number of rape cases as it occurred in a county. Okay? So we do that, again, by conducting a heterogeneity test by interacting the JOA with these two proxies, respectively. Again, apologies for this um, ugly table. But you can see here is that the number of civilians killed, um, pardon me for the typo, had no effect whatsoever on the rise of the CCP. Okay, in other words, it is only, so if you look at the row in red, it is only in the Japanese occupied area that the effect of the number of civilians killed actually makes a difference. Okay? And the same thing with rape cases, which is not significant uh, by itself, but it's very meaningful and significant in the context of Japanese occupation. Okay, so um, how, many, how much time do I have? Five minutes? Okay, so I'm going to skip this part, which everybody probably is interested in knowing. So because of that, you will probably ask me, uh, questions about why not KMP, so I've deliberately tried to escape this. <laughs> okay, I'll spend the last five minutes on talking about something which has to do with the present. Okay, so we ask the question, does war-induced nationalism have a long-term effect on national identity and regime support? So we are interested in national identity, we are interested in regime support, and we want to know whether this war-induced nationalist feeling that occurred seven decades, eight decades ago, continue to bear upon the psychology of the Chinese people. Now, let me show you some results instead of going through the theory. So the first one is to the left-hand side, the blue bar. Okay, so this is a measure of the scores of national sentiments. How do we measure it? We measured it based on a number of questions, but let me give you two interesting examples of that. So the first is, the question asks, military force should be applied to unify Taiwan, should conditions permit? Respondents were given a five-point scale, so you indicate whether you think it should be zero or five or somewhere in between. Now, the second question is, it is unre unrealistically to expect the Western hegemony led by the U.S. to truly tolerate China's rise to become a major partner. You know, you agree, five, you disagree, totally, zero, somewhere in between. So these are examples of how we construct the, the scores of national sentiments. And you can see that this is everywhere above zero. It is positive and then the confidence interval is nowhere near the zero value line. Okay, so we're suggesting that residents who are currently living in 
areas that were formerly JOAs, they had disproportionately stronger nationalist sentiments compared to the counterparts today. Okay, so something must be happening. There must be some intergenerational transmission. So this is a sort of topic that we need to study um, more. But this is the results. In other words, nationalism induced during the war has some long-term persistent effects over time. Now, one question doesn't, you know, doesn't convince people, including myself. So we look at the other question. So this is taken from the Asian Barometer Survey, asking the Chinese respondents, to what extent do you hold a positive perception towards Japan? And lo and behold, the answer is systematically negative and significant for those residents who lived in formerly JOA areas. Okay, it is, you know, below the zero line. So the third and the uh, um, the third and the fourth question um, asked about consumers' attitude towards Japanese products and brands proxied by total imports, value, uh, and the number of sushi restaurants. Of course, okay, granted, not sushi restaurants in China are probably not run by the Japanese, but it's got the symbol, right? So you can see that the results are also negative and significant, although not as negative and significant as the dislike towards the Japanese. But Residents living in formerly JOAs, they imported less, they bought less Japanese products, and then they consume less Japanese food. Moving on to regime support. So in 2012, and for a few years, the paramount leader Xi Jinping talked about this Chinese dream, how China should, you know, rescue itself from the 100 years of humiliating history and all that. And we tried to see whether residents living in a formerly JOA were more likely to go to the search engine, the Chinese search engine, Baidu, and to search for this particular term. And then because we have you know, IP address at the prefecture level, we were able to you know, sort of um, do the trick. And you can see the answer is significant, hugely significant, and positive. In other words, residents living in formerly JOA are more likely to go to the search engine and search for these words, indicating you know, their uh, maybe stronger uh, sentiments of um, regime support. So the last question um, basically also echoes the fourth one i.e. to what extent do you trust the central government in China? And you can see this is also turning out to be positive and significant. Wrapping up, there are two points to take away. So I hope to be able um, to convince you that the rise of the CCP is one of the most momentous events of the 20th century. And it shapes you know, the um, fortunes of many people, and it continues to be shaping the fortunes of many people. Now, the second point, and which is perhaps the more important point, is that uh, external regression led to the genesis of a very strong nationalist sentiment in wartime. And I was trying to convince you, but I haven't done enough research to show you that there is a reason if you think Many Chinese are behaving in a very nationalistic manner. I want to say that there's a reason for that. And um, to some extent, there is this strong linkage between nationalism created in wartime situation and nationalism today. OK, thank you very much for your patience. Thank you, Professor Kung, for this intriguing talk. Um, I found really insightful the fact that you highlighted how an occupying power can trigger not only patriotism and nationalism, but also um, trigger uh, extreme, extreme um, uh, 
politically extreme uh, beliefs uh, and movements. And this is definitely a, a situation that has many parallels in history. Uh, I also found very insightful the fact that you portrayed communism not like a top-down imposed ideology, but rather uh, like an ideology that started from the grassroots. Uh, so it's a much more complex phenomenon rather than a dictator's rule. Um, but yeah, uh, now we would like to open uh, the floor uh, for questions from the public. Uh, we have two roving microphones, uh, and please, uh, if you have a question, raise your hand and wait for the mic to arrive uh, before asking a question. Sorry, hello. So why did Japan either condone or encourage so much military violence against civilians when they invaded? Well, that is... I mean, in, in, in it's a question difficult to answer. Um, I think part of the answer has to be that in wartime situation, um, the hell broke loose, and so a lot of things can happen. So, I mean, this is, I would agree that this has gone overboard, but I wouldn't be, you know, totally surprised to see, you know, what happened. I, I don't know, you know, I don't have the answer to that. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, two comments, if I may please, and both questions. Uh, the first that struck me was that you're talking about the occupied areas where the CCP was particularly dominant in the 1940s. Uh, we know that in, in Europe, in, in Greece, in Italy and in France, the, a key player in all of the resistance forces there was the Communist Party. So is it perhaps that the most effective organisers in an occupied area are, are Leninist parties at this stage because of the, the internal discipline, often vicious discipline, that they, they had. So, so, that's the first. So, so, so these were areas occupied by the Japanese, not by the CCP. So the yes, CCP sorry, was a, no, but yeah. you're, you're saying that the CCP was the most effective in areas that were occupied by the Japanese. So the point I'm making is that the resistance forces in Greece and in Italy and in France were also dominated by communist parties. So is there something to do with the, the organisation structure of the parties that has that effectiveness? My, my second question, which is coming to your, your last um, conclusions about current day attitudes, um, the south of China, which seemed to have fewer of the nationalistic traits that you talked about, is also much more prosperous than the north of China. So is, is that perhaps reflecting? I'm not arguing that what you're saying is an influence, but is that perhaps suggesting that um, nationalism particularly appeals in areas that are not doing as well economically? Thank you. OK, so I, I, I think I, I, I won't disagree with your observation that you know, there might be a certain approach adopted by the communists in organization that make them more effective. But I guess the overall message of my uh, talk is that local party building was important, but in the absence of this nationalist sentiment generated, aroused by external um, aggression, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't actually need local party organization. So I think the ultimate exogenous cause, if I could sort of put it this way, would be the external war aggression imposed by the Japanese. So why is it that you know, the Japanese had to be that brutal during the war? It's, uh, it's, it's an answer, you know, it's something I don't have the answer to. So uh, what was your second question for that? Oh, the second question pertains to the difference in nationalistic attitude. Is that correct? Between the North and the South? So I, I don't know. We haven't disaggregated. So this is not 
in our current paper. So we have collected tons of data from Weibo, and we are trying to do some sort of really serious analysis of nationalist sentiments. And there we might be able to control for where they are. Okay, so but here we didn't make any distinction between um, the North and the South. So uh, in fact, you know, if we are correct, then the nationalist sentiment displayed by the Chinese, we expect that to be stronger in the North as opposed to the South. You know, that's the underlying message because the Japanese occupied area or happen to be in the South. Yeah. Um, just amazed at the amount of research that's gone into this. Got just, uh, my question relates to the gathering of your data. Um, some of it was dated, the research papers were dated 2006, others were 2014, in that basically in terms of the nationalism and what trans has transpired. Uh, in terms of the movement currently, things are moving very quickly. And does, do those attitudes still persist now in terms of uh, that strength? Because I sense that the warrior activity over the last few years may have may have been an expression of an analysis like this but it would appear from our Prime Minister being uh, recently in China that basically there's a backing off of using the nationalism as a, as, as a strength. Would you comment on that, please? Uh, so I, I think that's a, that's a sort of fair remark, but I, I am not 100% sure that there has been changes in the degree of nationalist sentiments over time, over especially over this short period of time. So my casual observation from interacting with my undergraduate students, both here and in Hong Kong, sort of suggests that deep down inside, the um, students who were born in the 1990s and the millennium, they were amazingly nationalistic. They were much more nationalistic than some of my previous PhD students, like the co-author of this paper, who was born in 1986. So I think this is a more sort of like serious research question that needs to be looked at. We, you know, towards the end, I just want to show you something I found that that amazes me personally, but I haven't done much research on it. Um, but I wouldn't that easy to come to the conclusion that, you know, 2014 is a long time from now, and then things may have changed, things may have changed from year to year, but, you know, I think the long-term trend, it's probably still relatively stable in the absence of any major shocks. Yeah, that, that's my response. Thank you, James. Thank you. This is how much, unfortunately, we have time for in terms of question. Uh, and I would like to highlight now that the faculty acknowledges, gratefully acknowledges, the contribution that the Peter Griffin and Terry Swan Foundation have done to economic history. And I would like now to welcome to the podium Peter Griffin to share a few words with us. Thank you very much indeed for coming and attending um, this magnificent lecture. And thank you, James, for that. I had some takeaways from it, which I thought were interesting, because what James has done is he's really outlined the, the, today's Chinese dream, which we're all living with, and how it came, in a sense, from the war suffering brought about, which was facilitated by the Japanese occupation of northern parts of China. And so what we've really learnt about is war-induced nationalism. And it makes you think about what might happen as a result of what's going on with the current wars at the moment. But thank you very much indeed, James, for coming to give us the lecture today. And I wanted to thank 
the dean and uh, you guys for putting up with me having a, uh, a an economic history um, lecture reintroduced and a facility reintroduced to the university. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, thanks everyone. This brings the, the lecture to an end. Uh, join me in thanking James and Peter Griffin and Terry Swan for joining us today. Thank you.